So I'm Susan Gold, and I have been in games since about 2001. And um, I learned the hard way. You know, I got thrown into the deep end. I was asked to create a program about entertainment technology. And I said, what the fuck is that? <laughs> um, and I really didn't know. And uh, then finally someone said, oh, you know, video games. And I went, huh? I don't know, <laughs> um, but I was a digital artist and I knew that I could find out. And uh, I have a bit of chutzpah, you might say, and uh, I started calling people and asking them questions and talking about what the process was to make a game. And so I played cultural anthropologist at a whole bunch of game studios because I was fortunate to live close to San Francisco. And what I saw in the development studios at the time was this collaboration of so many different people coming together. And I thought, as an educator, well, how do you make that happen in real life? You know, how do you make it happen in the classroom? And in 2003, 2004, 2005, you know, I'm teaching. 2006, I became the head of the IGDA Education uh, Special Interest Group. And so I got to meet a lot more educators and I got to you know, really start to feel like I was a part of a community of people that were doing things. And at the time we created the IGDA curriculum framework, which was a huge step forward in moving the educational process for people to get degrees specifically to game education. And then additionally, it kind of started to give us a framework of what needed to happen with our students. So I traveled around the world talking about this curriculum framework and meeting people along the way. And it was such an exciting experience for me. So I'd land at all these conferences and I would see games that people made. And I ended up in um, 2008, June of 2008, in uh, Visby, uh, Sweden, which is on the island of Gotland. And, um, I go to this conference, my friend's holding this conference at the University of Gotland, and uh, I go into one of the sessions, and it was a session from the Nordic Game Jam. And I had never heard of the Nordic Game Jam, and I really didn't know a ton of people in Europe, but I started watching these presentations. And the theme for the Nordic Game Jam that year was taboo, right? So imagine what they could have done with games. <laughs> Well, they were so funny. I mean, I was laughing. I just like, I loved the games that they made and the ones that they presented were particularly good. That year it was Darkroom Sex Game. Um, I don't know if you know that game, but it, you play with a Wii and you're trying to uh, make your partner <laughs> get to ecstasy. And then, so I was laughing, I almost fell out of my seat. And then there was this other game where you were trying to create the perfect baby. I referred to that as the German game, um, but it was made in the Netherlands. And, uh, you know, I was just like, who's in charge of this organization, this Nordic Game Jam? And there was my friend Gormlai, or soon to be friend. Because when I first met him, he was like, who is this crazy lady? And I said to him, you know what? I want to do this everywhere. And he's like, oh, okay. I'm like, I want the Nordic Game Jam to be our flagship, and we will model what you guys do, and I'm going to make this happen all over the world at the same time. And he went, uh-huh, <laughs> and walked away. Um, so then I like emailed him. I came home. I'm like, I have this great idea. So I called my friend Ian Schreiber. And he was uh, still in school, but um, you know, was a very practiced and experienced game designer. And I had known him for a while. And I said, what do you think of this idea? And he's like, I like it. We could do this, we could do that, blah, blah, blah. So we called Gorm up and we're like, we can do this. I am gonna make this happen all over the world simultaneously. And then he kind of grooved on the idea finally. You know, he's like, I think she can do it. And, uh, and so we started planning. And that was in July of 2008. August of 2008, I went to a conference called SIGGRAPH. And I started telling people I wanted to have a game jam on every continent. Well, maybe except for Antarctica. I'm still working on Antarctica, by the way. Um, but I, uh, I, I, I like, targeted people from Africa and people that I didn't know, you know, I'm like Southeast Asia, whatever. 
And uh, I said I want to do this, and uh, I barely had a website up. It was probably, um, I don't even know how to explain it, but it was probably uh, the most rudimentary HTML website you've ever seen, because I did it myself. And uh, uh, I had no idea how I was going to pull it all together. So I start asking my friends in education, will you host a site? And I started getting people saying yes, yes, yes. And one of the people that I asked was my friend Jim Whitehead at University of California, Santa Cruz. So we're doing these Q&A sessions online, um, you know, and uh, I think it was on Skype, right? And uh, there was uh, the student that he, uh, that Jim made in charge of the UCSC website, or the, uh, uh, location, this guy named Fouad. And uh, he's texting me on the side while we're having a conversation with all these interested people. Oh, I can help you with that. And I latched on <laughs> and haven't let go for 10 years because I was not a technology genius. I'm an artist, I'm a thinker, but I'm not the tech person. So I uh, said, okay, you're in charge. <laughs> and I handed it off to FOAD and we started to create the technology and infrastructure in which to start to launch this massive event. And um, everybody was naysaying me like, oh, you know, I don't know how this is gonna work. Nobody's gonna participate. But lo and behold, come, what was it, January 29th, 2009, 53, 54 locations, a couple hundred people. Oh my God, it worked. And the next year, it got even bigger. And the year after that, even bigger. So I'm happy to report the amount of locations, on average, we're growing about 43% per year. And uh, my boyfriend figured out that we're going to have to move to the moon in order to continue to have locations because we keep growing exponentially. And so it was exciting. It was exciting to see the first games. It was exciting to feel like we had a community. And what was even more historic was that for some of these locations, it was the first time that any of the people in that area had met each other. So it wasn't just schools. It was places that had no game development community before. And what we found was that the Global Game Jam, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> really started to create community. And that by far is one of the greatest things that we bring to the table with the Global Game Jam. Now we're in over 100 countries over you know, the past uh, 10 years, uh, over 100 countries have participated. And we have had the opportunity to really profoundly affect what is going on in many of these places. You know, in North America, it's very easy to say, oh, you know, you, you put your stuff up on Steam. But when we started, there was no Steam. You know, uh, oh, you know, we're going to get our games out. But you have to remember, 10 years ago, Indiecade was probably most independent developers only entree into getting their game seen. And it has grown over the years so tremendously. But when things started, you know, we had no idea what to expect. And this year, I think we made close to 8,000 games, which in one weekend is mind-blowing. I mean, really, think about that. We went from 500-some-odd games to almost 8,000 games. And that's just a tremendous jump in the amount of people participating, but also the amount of people that are interested in game development around the world. So that is a huge record, and I think, you know, over the years, this democratization of game development has profoundly affected the lives of people all around the world. And we are so happy to be part of that stimulus that gets people together and creates those communities. The one thing that makes the Global Game Jam unique is that it is a physical game jam. You're not doing it online. You're actually going someplace and you're gonna meet people. And hopefully in those locations, you'll create new friends, create new teammates, learn new things. Over the years, um, with the availability of free tools that are often associated with the Global Game Jam, uh, people, about 50% of our participants say that they've learned something new over the course of 48 hours. 
Well, as an educator, let me tell you, that is huge, you know? That is amazing kind of feedback to get from different people. Like, I gained something from this experience. But beyond just gaining a new tool, they've gained confidence, they've gained relationships. At the Global Game Jam, we have Global Game Jam marriages, we have Global Game Jam babies, we have Global Game Jam companies. Um, we have really watched as the community has evolved. And we are so proud to have been a part of it and we are even more excited to grow with our community. For me, as an educator, it was an opportunity to see my students make something from beginning to end in the course of 48 hours, which if you hadn't been in games in 2009, 2010, very often you didn't have classes where you actually produced an entire game. You did little bits, you did little that, but there was no pipeline. All of a sudden, games became very real to participants. And that was what made it so exciting for, for those that were participating, and it also gave them confidence. And I don't know about all of you, but as an artist, having that confidence gives me the desire to wake up the next day and try again. You know, And I may not have made the greatest game at the Game Jam, but I learned something from that process. I learned that, I need to work on prototyping or I need to work on, or, or iterate on this. And what we're asking when we ask people to post their games on our website was to allow others to see what it was you did in the course of 48 hours. So I was hoping that would be a learning tool as well. And much to Fouad's chagrin, we keep all those games. And it's quite a hefty Amazon bill. But we still feel that it is extremely important to have that history for everybody to see where they came from and where they are now. And for, I hope, many people, they can look under the hood of what makes a game and see how people did things. So that, too, is an additional learning experience. So for me, this whole coming together of people bringing GORM, Ian, Fouad, and myself, we've become a pretty tight group. Uh, we fight like children. Um, we have a, a, a real dynamic, but we are always welcoming new people into the fold. We feel that it's so important that the Global Game Jam continue to grow and to be not just us, but you. And that is truly one of the most important things for us, is that we are a community unto itself. I myself am so proud of seeing people's games when they come and show me their games. I've been to GDC where people have run up and said, are you Susan Gold? And I look at them wondering if they're a process server and then <laughs> say, why? And they tell me, oh, I made a game at the Global Game Jam and it was so amazing and what a great experience. And sometimes they bring me to tears. It, there are so many wonderful stories related to the Global Game Jam out there. But more than those stories and all those things, there are the games. And uh, I'm going to pass this to Fawad right now and have him talk to you about what we've seen over the course of the past 10 years. Especially indebted to Susan and our two other uh, co-founders who aren't here, uh, our president, Gorm Lai, and Ian Schreiber. It's been a wonderful experience for 10 years. So, uh, what we've done here is uh, we've selected a few games, a few of the interesting games uh, to talk about. But before we get into that, I'd like to do a disclaimer. So Global Game Jam is 100 countries. Uh, it is not a competition. And um, we don't really have like a formal way of figuring out what's the best game. And we don't really want to, because it's not really about that anyway. So there is a caveat here. They're, these games that we've chosen tend to skew towards the westernized world, and uh, that's because of the resources that are available uh, you know, for people like in the US or in, in Europe, uh, not the same as resources for you know, developers in, say, Cuba or Palestine, which we do have. So I, I want to put that caveat out there that just because there is a particular selection here that we've chosen that are successful games that have been published and, and gone far, doesn't mean that's the totality of what's available at Global Game Jam. So I invite all of you to go to globalgamejam.org, look at the past games, look at what's happening to get a better idea. So with that, let me start our first game. 
so this was uh, from our first Global Game Jam back in uh, 2009 called Four Minutes, 33 Seconds of Uniqueness. So this is based on the avant-garde John Cage uh, um, concert called uh, Four Minutes, 33 Seconds. Who's familiar with that? Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, you know, this was, a, uh, this was an experimental uh, concert. It was supposed to be, it was supposed to heighten your senses. I mean, the way it works for some people who didn't raise their hand, essentially um, a uh, pianist will go sit behind the, the piano and then uh, for four minutes and 33 seconds, uh, we'll do nothing. It's gonna be all silence. And uh, it, was, it, was, it got a lot of press uh, when it was uh, first um, released. And uh, you know, it was, a, it was a kind of a deconstruction of what it meant to be uh, a uh, piano concert. And um, taking their cue from this, uh, Petri Perho, uh, from Copenhagen in our inaugural 2009 um, Global Game Jam made a game that was called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds of Uniqueness. And I uh, apologize to give you uh, this as a spoiler because I kind of have to, there's no other way to talk about it. Uh, but uh, you should have the um, uh, Constellation Prize knowing that you can't play this game anyway. So uh, the, uh, the game, the way it works is that this is a screenshot of the game down here in the bottom right four minutes and 33 seconds of uniqueness. It's basically like a DOS box that shows up. It's all black at the beginning, and then it starts getting more and more white. There's a bar of white that comes in from the left side, right? If the bar makes it all the way to the end, then you win the game. And it takes four minutes and 33 seconds to, to, for the bar to get there. Now, when you play the game, you have no idea what's going on. You just uh, you start the game and you just have to watch. So it's kind of a deconstruction of what it means to be a game and how much interaction do you need for something to be called a game. But it is very much a game because what happens is when you play the game, when you launch the game, behind the scenes, the game makes a connection to a server and registers you as someone who started the game. And uh, if nobody else in the entire world, in the next four minutes and 33 seconds, starts the game, then you win. If they do, if anybody else starts, then uh, the bar won't make it and you have to start from scratch. So um, this, was, uh, this was published by uh, Purho, uh, Clooney Games, and in fact it was so popular that it received uh, its own follow-up response game by none other than Jesper Yule, uh, called 4 Minute 32. Is, is Jesper here? Okay. All right, uh, so yeah, he's, he's around. We could um, you know, have him explain it if he likes. So another one that's, uh, that's really interesting, all the way back from 2010, it's called Neely. It was done at Global Game Jam Sydney. And this is a game that really explores the kind of thing that is, is, um, uh, Global Game Jam is known for. So in 48 hours, obviously, those of you who've done game jams, those of you who've done game development, you're not going to have the best art. You're not going to have the best polish, right? You're not even going to have the best story. But the thing that you might get is you might stumble on or develop a mechanic or a kind of interface that is very unique. And then you would, uh, you would uh, build your game around that. Those are the kind of things that come out of Global Game Jam and later on go on to do wonderful things. And this is one of them. It's an audio uh, kind of a uh, uh, mechanic. And uh, that's why you have this, this, um, this headline here, Roar Neely. Now, I, this is not the kind of thing I can even explain. That we have to have a video. So I have a video, and I hope it plays right. So we'll find out. OK, another game, same kind of uh, uh, innovation. Um, that we were talking about actually was by none other than Rami back when uh, in 2011, uh, Global Game Jump 2011. The game is called Glitch Hiker. Um, it was developed in the Netherlands. Um, Rock, Paper, Shotgun wrote a great uh, story about all these games really got a lot of press, which was really helpful to these, to these developers. So this game, what was special about this game? Anybody heard of this one? Okay, okay, good, a few of you. So what was special about this game was that they decided the game itself is going to die, right? So the game itself has a number of lives, and if those number of lives go down to zero, then no one can play the game. So what happens is, as a, um, as a player of this game, you, um, if, if you start playing this game, 
and you die, that takes one life away from the game itself. But if you play the game, every 100 points that you score, that adds another life to the game. So the idea was you play the game, and then you extend the life of the game itself by you know, getting more and more points in. And people have to keep playing. Otherwise, you know, people who play and then die really fast will take away from the life of the game. And uh, the whole thing was networked so that you know, everybody who played it got, uh, got, got to contribute or decrease the life of the game. So within about six hours, the game died. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, they have never let anyone play the game, at least the way it was back then, uh, since, uh, since that time. So the game is dead. But it was an interesting philosophical experiment. A lot of, a lot of papers and, and uh, discussions were had uh, on this game. So, Another kind of innovation that we've seen from Global Game Jam. Mushroom 11. Mushroom 11 kind of burst on the scene back also from 2011 in uh, NYU. And this got a lot of accolades. It got 9 out of 10 on um, uh, Steam. It is published now. Uh, it had an IGN nomination. It had an Indicate Award. And uh, this was just a very interesting, kind of a cute, but but very well thought out game that was a post-apocalyptic mushroom, right? And it was just going around making its way around landscape. And the way it was designed and the, and the, and the uh, techniques that it used were really interesting. So it got a lot of press. Check it out if you have a chance. Mirror Moon. Uh, Mirror Moon was a 2012 game out of uh, Genova, Italy. And uh, this was by, uh, by the team Santa Ragione. Uh, these are the people who later uh, did uh, Wheels of Aurelia, which is a uh, text adventure driving game. Um, a, uh, and this was also nominated for 2012 Indicate. Uh, it got an IG, it was a uh, IGF Nuovo finalist. Uh, the idea in this game is that it is a pure explorer. And it does, it captures that feeling of exploring something for the first time new. It's kind of a space exploration game. And um, from a Eurogamer, get one of the one of the most interesting codes. One of the purest exploration games I've ever played, and so uh, and this got a lot of award and got a lot of publicity. And it's available from the Santa Ragione website if you want to see the latest version. But also developed during uh, Global Game Jam. Surgeon Simulator. Who's heard of this one? Right, a lot of people. Uh, got a lot of very good publicity. Almost the entire thing. Almost exactly like the way they, re they, they uh, released it was actually done during Global Game Jam. In fact, uh, it's all available at globalgamejam.org if you want to look at it with source code. And uh, so this was done by Team Basso at, uh, 20, in Global Game Jam 2013 in London. Uh, it was nominated for a BAFTA award. It uh, won some other awards for strategy and simulation. And um, this kind of, to me, this is on the list because not only won a lot of awards and became successful and everything, but also it kind of demonstrates the kind of thing that can happen at Global Game Jam can't really happen at a AAA studio, right? I mean, can you imagine some AAA uh, studio head walking in and say, you know what we need? We need a surgical simulation game, right? Uh, it's hard to, hard to imagine something like that would happen. And, uh, but it would happen here at Global Game Jam. It was great. Uh, uh, first person, uh, 3D, was very nicely done. Soul Phil, who's heard of this one? OK, OK, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad we have that. Um, 2014 out of Philly, Philly Game Jam, uh, Jason Marziani did almost all of it. So this is a uh, kind of a um, live action player live action game player where you using your phone and, uh, and some audio and, uh, and uh, um, instructions, you're supposed to go around and do interesting things you've never done before. Staring people at public transportation, staring people in the face and taking public transportation. <laughs> um, some other things, uh, depending on where you are. Keep talking, nobody explodes. This one is pretty popular, right? Everybody heard of this one? So uh, team out of uh, Canada. Uh, did this in 2014. It's now on Steam. It's won all kinds of awards. Just just became available on uh, PS4. Um, it uh, has done well overall. But again, the kind of thing that you would only think about if you have this situation where people would come together and they only have 48 hours, right? And this game specifically relies on communicating in person with someone. 
So if this was like an online collaboration, I don't think these ideas would come easily to this, to this team as they, uh, as they did when this was an in-person game. So just for those of you who don't know, this is a, uh, this is a game where one person is wearing the uh, Oculus Rift 3D um, uh, headset, and then other people are telling them how to, how to defuse a bomb. And so the way it works is that uh, when you keep talking, you, you, you keep uh, getting instructions from your teammates, and then you, you know, collaborate, and together you can help defuse the bomb. Uh, if you stop getting instructions, and of course, not getting good instructions, then, then you fail and the bomb goes off. Home improvisation. <laughs> Some of you know this. Again, what AAA studio would come in and say, you know what we need is like an Ikea game, right? And so uh, this one did really well. It's on Steam. Uh, it was also in 2015 Indicate. I have a video on this one as well that, that is, is kind of nice. Um, it, the, uh, they did the promotion just right. In the beginning, it was just the four of us, but now there are thousands of us. You know, uh, we have people in the audience that host locations as well. And it's a lot of work to, to organize all these things. And so we've become a network of, of people that believe in the game jam and people that truly, truly love us and go out of their way to make us succeed. Um, we are very fortunate in that respect that our community is always growing and there are always people interested. The one thing I guess I want to conclude with before we go on to questions is that anybody can jam. It's not for just the most experienced people. It's for people that don't have experience. Um, when I was doing the uh, talk on Friday, um, I jumped in and did audio at a game jam. I am by no means an audio expert and hadn't even opened up the software for years. But you know what? You figure out how to do things. And the other interesting thing about the Game Jam is we're not just digital games. You know, We want to also include all forms of games. So we have card games, board games, live action games. And we just want to open up the world to innovation, collaboration, and experimentation. And I think at that, we will start taking any questions, if anybody has them. Please. Um, Hello. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Uh, yeah so uh, I've I've uh, done the Global Game Jam uh, uh, at a lot of different, um, a bunch of different places. Uh, I find that my experience uh, generally, I enjoy it much more when there's no competition, and actually the games that I create are much better. Um, I, I don't know if this is like a question so much as like a, a topic, but um, part of me like I kind of want to um, like talk to the organizers and say like stop giving awards and stop rewarding people uh, and stop you know judging the games. Because, it, uh, I don't know, like in my perspective, like so many more people feel left out than the people who feel rewarded. Uh, and it also, I feel like it kind of uh, discourages uh, like real, like total, like, you know, the, the first couple of games that I made, I, I found myself um, asking myself, what would just, like what would be cool? Uh, and then as I was like in other game jams that um, were more about um, uh, winning awards or like, whatever they were ranked or uh, so on, would be what's the best kind of game? Like what would be a good game to make? Uh, and that was a very different mentality, and the games weren't as good. Um, so uh, what do you say to that? And also, what would you say to um, like uh, uh, actively discouraging uh, or like shy, like telling or organizations to like maybe, you know, hey, don't you know, don't do that. What do you think about that? Uh, l let me take that. Um, so uh, your your comments are right on. Uh, we do actively discourage uh, competitions and awards. The only things that are allowed is if the uh, organizers themselves want to have some kind of audience choice or something like that. Now, I should let you know that if you were in like a heavily competitive uh, uh, game jam, that is not the norm. Most places don't do it that way. However, uh, we decided that uh, because uh, some people just want to get some feedback and uh, and want to see their the work be uh, evaluated by a jury, that we would allow a limited form of local kind of best of show kind of a uh, kind of a competition. But we never do a global competition. Now, one solution we have to that is that uh, anyone can start a, a, a jam site. So in the past, where we had locations where you know there were like huge locations and they charge money and they have you know uh, judges and things like that. Another site right next to it could be 
uh, could be uh, inaugurated and uh, would not have uh, some of those uh, aspects of the, of the first jam. So we, are, we make sure that we don't monopolize, we don't let anyone monopolize the jam side of the city. But we do have to kind of uh, balance out how much freedom we give to each individual organizers because they're doing a lot of the work, they're finding the space and we don't charge them any money or anything so it's all, it's all locally done. And so if some of them want to have a limited form of audience choice award or something like that, that is a lot. But your recourse is to find another jam that is nearby that doesn't have that. Also, I should say that a lot of the times the locations have sponsors and the sponsors want winner. And that really does drive a, a lot of things. And, and as we're just an umbrella organization, like we give the boundaries and the parameters, but we can't police 700 locations. We make recommendations. We highly encourage them not to be competitions. I, and um, like I had someone tell me, I won the Global Game Jam. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> you know, like how does that happen? Because I wasn't a part of that. But the truth is that at specific locations, they get someone to, to give them prizes or they're like, oh, we'll give you some money, but we want our, you know, we want the best, uh, I don't know, uh, Oculus game or something like that. I mean, Oculus never did that to anybody, but you know, let's say they did. Um, how do you tell a location? Well, you just took five grand from those people, and you know. So we really try to be as hands off as possible with our locations, because they they it's their time, it's their uh, expense, and uh, we want them to be happy, but we also want to encourage them not to do a competition. So things that I like are like when people get certificates of participation, those are the kinds of things that I feel are really good. But for all of us, the experience is the reward. That's really where we're going. And that's what we like. Uh, let me also quickly add uh, that we have uh, surveys at the end of the Global Game Jam. And this is a question that we've surveyed, we've well polled our community many times. And it is true that the majority don't want competition, but the, but the numbers of the people who do want competition is not uh, insignificant. So because of that, we kind of don't want to be heavy handed about it and say you can't have any kind of competition. Certainly there's no global competition. Uh, I saw on some Global Game Jam sites uh, something weird happening and I was wondering what was your policy about it. Uh, it would be Global Game Jam in some video game schools where uh, participants uh, are, uh, being a participant is mandatory, but also using one certain tool that they learn in class is also mandatory. And it's not becoming really uh, a Global Game Jam for for, for fun and for discovering what a game, but more as an academic exercise. So what's your opinion about that? Uh, so what we allow is that you could have, in addition to our themes and uh, requirements, that you can have what we call a local uh, constraint, if you want to put a local constraint on it. And some places have that, very few places, but some places have that. And uh, in general, we leave it up to the local organizer if they want to decide something like that. Uh, but let me again em emphasize how easy it is to host a jam. I'm not talking, you don't have to own like a big lecture hall or anything like that. We're talking about 10, 15 people. If you're in school, you can get a classroom and do it. Anyone can do this. And so what we want to do is encourage many, many different kinds of locations. Additionally, I mean, uh, so I went to the uh, Angemid location in Angloem, France, and uh, it was during the um, comic book festival. Um, they have this huge comic book festival at the end of January, it goes for weeks. And what they would do is they would just bring one of the artists that was a part of the festival and ask to make an additional constraint. So the interesting thing, and I don't know if we really talked about this at all, is the Global Game Jam is focused around a, a, a main theme, right? So we have a whole committee of people that pick the theme, um, work very hard to try to make it so that 
it's uh, very open-ended. And then we come up with what we call uh, constraints or what are we calling them? Diversifiers. So those are for people that are typically a little more sophisticated in, or experienced in, in making games. And some of them are as simple of, uh, as you can only use your thumb to play the game or you have to use all 10 fingers to play the game. Like So we add those little diversifiers to them. And then um, occasionally, uh, we have sponsored diversifiers. So like if a, a company comes to us and we're like, we'd like you to try our new tools, can we distribute these? You know, we'll add those. But uh, at another point, you know, uh, if you come up with your own and you say, hey, we would like you to include uh, like comic bubbles or whatever at schools or what happens, you know, we're fine with that. We have no problem just as long as the theme stays the same. But as for, you know, should it be mandatory for a student, um, I have a hard time making anything mandatory, except other than, you know, I push my students so hard. I'm like, you need to do this, you need to do this. Because it really is not only gratifying, but it's such a great learning experience. So um, some schools, if that's what they decide, is going to be, you know, part of kickstarting kids into into games, then, you know, that's that school or, or location's decision. It's not a primary uh, focus for us as an organization. Let me also say that as, as a uh, educator myself, I would never make Global Game Jam mandatory. I mean, you can't make anything that's 48 hours mandatory. Uh, it's just not good policy. Uh, so what I've done in the past, and I do this because I teach game design, I say that if you do go to Global Game Jam and have a game, that could count as one of your projects that you could do. And then you could talk about that because, you know, having 30, 40 hours straight on a game is also very unusual and you could get a lot done in one weekend might otherwise take you three or four weeks. Yeah, and um, the other thing I would highly recommend that we haven't really talked about, like post-Global Game Jam, we really recommend that people do play, play dates, you know, like where people actually come back and return and play the games. You know, that also starts to, you know, coalesce the, the community and make it, things more solid and real. So uh, we, we make those kinds of suggestions, but again, we don't make anything mandatory. The only thing we make mandatory is that you have a location, you have Wi-Fi, safety, and uh, that there's access to food nearby. We don't even make you cater. It's just a matter of, you know, we want people not to die of starvation while they're there. However, I have to say it, and Jameen, it was the best global game jam I ever had, where I got champagne and gravlax and oysters. It was oh, the best game jam ever. <laughs> Celia. I have a really quick question. I know we're out of time. Is the global game jam a game? <laughs> How meta. It really, yeah, it kind of is a game. It, it's a big uh, simulation resource management game. <laughs> Uh, I think that's a good place to end. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for joining us.